comes a time in the development of every family when the children begin to ask questions. And one of the questions that can be looked forward to with some apprehension is the inevitable one, where did I come from? The family braces for this, and according to its own insight and its estimation of the intelligence of the child, attempts to explain the origin of life. First of all, of course, the child is asked, where did I come from? This is always overlooked, for there is no ready and available answer. The parents, if they are modern and feel that they cannot expose their children to legendary, uh, attempt a simple statement of biology. Uh, the best they can possibly hope to accomplish with or without the aid of the birds and the bees is a description of some kind relative to the origin of the physical body of that child. Because the youngster has no particular point in mind when he asks the question, usually merely interested in larger generalities, uh, the child does not normally question further. He accepts an answer that is obviously inadequate because he has no way of estimating adequacy. The matter then rests for a time and may not be brought up again for 50 or 60 years. The information that has been provided is regarded as gospel, and later various courses in school and college support this position. But our remote ancestors, back in the days when they were trying to orient themselves in this universe in which we live, were a little more thoughtful and a little more idealistic in their approach to this large issue. In order to understand where we come from, we have to find out where the world came from. We have to understand the entire process of creation itself. For only against the background of a great universal law or pattern can the development of individual forms of life be properly considered. From the most ancient times, therefore, we may say that concepts concerning the origin of things the origin of existence itself, divided into two general patterns. These patterns have descended to us in philosophy, religion, science, and we are still clinging to some aspect of this ancient thinking, although we have attempted to enlarge and deepen our understanding. There are only two ways in which you can answer the question of first cause. One is to take the attitude that there was a beginning of some kind. No matter how you try to work with this situation, it is embarrassing. Uh, if, for example, you imagine the child asking questions to be a little older and a little wiser, and you tell that child that he came from his parents, then the next question would be, where did the parents come from? they came from their parents, and so on by regression to an inevitable point of uncertainty. Where did the primordial original first parents come from? This question is still not answered, and uh, is not likely to be, except by further uh, regression of thinking. Some scientists might point out that we came from the anthropoids, then the question is, where did the anthropoids come from? Then we can go back through all the different forms of life to a monocellular organism sometime in the dawn of things, but we are still burdened with the question, where did that come from? Therefore, all questions concerning beginning uh, have to be approached non-logically. You cannot possibly 
uh, develop a, a logical sequence that will include the origin of first cause. The uh, theological approach to this in several different areas has been to assume that creation was created by a divine being. This is probably the ultimate theological regression. It is as far back as even the most pious-minded can think. We must then assume that apart from creation, there was a creator, and that for some reason, at a certain time, long ago, or not so long ago, according to the denomination you belong to, uh, this creator caused by his own will or by the verbum, the speaking of the ineffable word, uh, to uh, cause the world to come forth. Here we have then a creator separate from creation, ordaining it, creating it, fashioning it, uh, dominating, governing, and ruling it, and planning its progress over a period of time. Obviously, this pattern nearly always includes an ultimate dissolution of this world. It returns at some infinite time in the future to the unknowable being from which it came. We seem to have a rather neat package here, except for one difficulty. Where did God come from? What was the nature of this being? Uh, was this being ever existing? The only answer that seems to be possible is, therefore, that it was ever existing. For it is almost inconceivable to man to imagine God growing up from a small child. Uh, we are confronted, then, with deity as an unknowable value, an in inevitable and ultimate uh, value, beyond which we cannot go. What uh, constitutes the nature of the divine what is the basic power of the divine consciousness uh, theologians do not like to uh, discuss. It gets to be too complicated, and we are not in the presence of any satisfactory uh, formal knowledge which can withstand the debates of opposing opinions. The second theory or, uh, or philosophy that has been fashioned simply, frankly, assumes that what, what we might term the infinite essence or infinite nature of things is by its own quality and principle eternal. That everything that exists is in essence eternal. And that what we call creation is merely a manifestation, a conditioned existence arising within an eternal nature. According to this concept, creation is not the result of the dictum of an arbitrary or separate deity. Creation is a manifestation of principles that are inherent within existence itself, existence being eternal and inevitable. Uh, this attitude, this conviction, I think, held most of the better minds of the past, that at the beginning root or substance of all conditioned existence as we can imagine it, whether of human beings or of suns or of solar systems or of galaxies or of cosmic chains, even of space itself, at the root and source of all of this is essence, an unconditioned nature of itself, capable of manifesting condition but always containing within its own ineffable principle all that can be manifested from it. Thus we may say that existence moves into the production of existences, and these existences return again to existence which continues. Uh, it was interesting to realize that some rather ancient peoples, uh, long before the benefits of knowledge as we have them today, were able to conceive of this total existence, to conceive that it transcended time, the time was merely an expression of it, that it, ex uh, it transcended space, space was only a manifestation of it, and that there exists somewhere, everywhere, 
in the innermost and outermost parts of all things and in all the intervals between the innermost and the outermost one indivisible essence one indivisible being and that this continuing forever is the base material the earth in which creation grows and the creation itself is merely a continuing process in which the potentials of this infinite existence uh, are gradually transformed into potencies or manifestations. Today I believe the tendency is to assume this general concept. In the uh, development of this concept, of course, many systems of philosophy lost sight of the idea of an ultimate deity. They lost sight of the concept of one conscious being at the source of life. Rather, they thought of an eternal being, all conscious, always. And that consciousness as we know it is as much a conditioned state of universal consciousness as bodies as we know them are conditioned state of states of universal substance. Uh, this uh, general attitude uh, seemed to provide the best foundation for the creation of a philosophic system. For systems have to be born just as beings are born, out of a primary conviction. And the primary conviction becomes the essence of that doctrine or that philosophy, which merely expands and extends it. We may term the primary conviction a premise or an hypothesis, but upon it must be built all uh, that follows after it in terms of the detailed explanation of the processes of creation. Out of the general opinion and uh, substance of many ancient systems, we can gain a certain basic idea of the uh, beginnings of human thought in these matters. In both East and West, in the most ancient cultural concepts, we find therefore that, so to say, in the beginning or from the beginning or however we want to call it, throughout eternity, from that which has no beginning or end as we know it, but beginning now in the sense of fundamental, basic, uh, that which is the source of all else that in this kind of a beginning there was an infinite essence infinitely diversified spreading through all time and space as a great principle of life that this life principle transformed what might be termed vacuum into a dynamic space area or field this field is limitless eternal inevitable and it extends not only beyond the stars as we see them, but beyond all creations of all kinds, beyond even our imagination. This is one potency, one tremendous dynamic. And this dynamic is invisible to us, beyond our comprehension, has no form or shadow by which we can see it, and in its natural and inevitable state is not even imaginable by us. Consequently, we cannot define this nature. We can only accept uh, in terms of thoughts or in terms of words that there is this unconditioned eternal. And that in some mysterious way, this is the cause that existence as we know it can exist. That existence can exist only because life exists. And life itself is one of the basic manifestations of space, of eternity. And it causes from its own nature all the living things that are dependent upon life for their existence. So we can either consider the ancient writings of the Zohar, the Kabbalah of the early Jews, or the ancient Vedic writings and, the, and particularly the Puranas of the Hindus, or the Yiging, the classic of change, the ancient book of China, or any one of many other uh, early records. They all seemingly 
have admitted the same essential principle, that there was an eternity, and that this eternity is the principle which peoples and nations have gradually come to identify as God. God, therefore, is primarily abstractly the mysterious unity of eternal life. Uh, deity is the one that permeates all. It is the one undifferentiated. It is that which is one in sense of total unity. And from this inevitable and ineffable source, all things originate. Now this would cause naturally a consideration of what the Gnosis and the Kabbalists call the doctrine of emanations. Here we have something that goes on like a great ocean, a Dao in China. Here is the great sea, the inevitable. Uh, we watch it in our mind's eye because we cannot see it. But we can imagine it as though it were a vast ocean extending through all eternity. And it is quiet, and it seems to be unmoved. And yet somewhere in the apparently transparent depths of it, uh, there have to be things, seeds, lives, principles, energies, essences. And these are capable of coming forth uh, out of this uh, procedure under certain conditions. We then come to the problem of conditions. And this again forces us back into the idea of how it all started. How did this eternal potential uh, suddenly uh, dynamically come to generate? How did this sea, which is forever itself, suddenly cause something to arise within it, which seems to be a diminution of itself? Uh, two principles are involved in the solution to this. The first is uh, that this vast ocean of potential was also forever creating, that the process of creation is as eternal as the principle itself. Therefore, no matter how far you want to go back in your imagination, the creating process was already in operation. There was no time when this wheel suddenly started to turn. It has always turned. For what we might regard as this first impulse, the first movement of things, is an eternal movement, first again in quality rather than in time. Consequently, uh, space or eternity or essence was forever producing from itself production being an essential part of its eternal nature. The other point of view is that this God concept produced an infinite descent or generation of beings, divine beings, who use space as the raw material for the creation of universes and cosmic systems uh, created by their will and purpose and that this chain of descending beings is also eternal, that it never began and it never will end, but that there is in this space itself, as part of its own nature, an eternal descent of creators, that part of space's own structure is creative consciousness, which manifests automatically and continuously forever. Well, for people who did not know anything about our modern thinking in astronomy and physics and all these subjects, this was pretty profound uh, reasoning. But as uh, we study it more carefully, we begin to appreciate some of the validity of this pattern. Uh, that uh, universes come and go, worlds are fashioned as men are fashioned, and disappear again as men disappear. But as the passing of the individual has no uh, permanent effect upon the unfoldment of humanity as a collective, so the passing of a thousand solar systems has no effect upon the eternal movement or eternal unfoldment in space itself. For space is ever begetting, ever producing, and gradually the forms which it engenders disappear back again in their fatigue or exhaustion into the principles which created them. 
In the Indian philosophy, we have an interesting sidelight on this point. Well, in the Indian thinking, uh, creation is not only this continuous production, but it is dominated by a law of periodicity. Uh, the so-called creating powers do not create continuously. Uh, they create for a certain length of time, and then the creating principle and all of its productions fade again into a kind of sleep, which in India is called a pralaya. In this particular uh, concept of things, uh, the idea is uh, that the life of a creating deity is also measured in time. Uh, this time is infinitely greater than anything that we can imagine. The life of one of these creative deities may extend into hundreds of billions of human years. Yet this being in some way emerged, not by the process of growing up as we know it, but by a parallel or equivalent process, a process of unfolding. Growth in terms as we term the word implies the release of potential, the gradual unfolding of a state of maturity. This also in another dimension, but in the same essential principle, uh, accounts for the emergence of deities. Deities come forth not from nothing, but from the previousness of themselves. They awaken, as we might say, from sleep. And uh, the intervals between the great creative cycles of a deity are referred to as intervals of sleep. And the manifestation of this deity is referred to as a day of manifestation. And the retiring of this deity into non-manifestation is called a night or a period of sleep. These together are referred to as the days and nights of Brahma. Now, in this particular pattern, of course, we are referring only to a deity. And it makes no difference whether this deity is the ruler of a solar system or the creator of a vast uh, galaxy. Uh, all the time, deities, uh, as expressions of the infinite, are coming into manifestation, awaking from the sleep of ages, or as one of the ancient books says, rousing themselves from the seven nights of rest so that there are seven cycles of rest and seven days of manifestation symbolically to make up the life of the creating power in the in emerging therefore uh, this deity takes the place perhaps of some other that is fading into sleep and as there are millions and hundreds of millions of these systems in space in all different degrees of growth, maturity, and decline, uh, space itself continues to be forever inhabited by creations, just as the earth is continually inhabited by creatures, although none of these creatures has a continuous existence as far as we can see or tell. This is a pretty large concept, but uh, is almost certainly the best that we know at the present time. So to summarize the point as far as we have gone, we can simply say uh, that space itself is like an infinite universe of existences, and that the stars and the great constellations and the great orders of life uh, are like hosts of beings inhabiting space, subject to all the laws which in a small way man is subject to but still like man having this mysterious power of perpetuating the great purpose of life although as an individual he cannot perpetuate himself physically indefinitely any more than a solar system can all stars and planets and solar systems and galaxies must in time fade away but as they fade others will take their places and the continual process will be unbroken in this same thinking also those that fade away do not surely or truly die. Man may fade away as far as his manifestations are concerned. His body disappears. And in the case of the universe, the great 
luminary, the great sun in the center of a solar system may gradually burn out. But this does not mean that the sun dies. It merely means that it retires from an objective to a subjective state again in this great ebb and flow of the tides of life. For in the processes of creation, there must always be this duality of motion, uh, the two motions recognized by Lao Tzu. There must be the outflowing motion and the returning motion, as in the case of the movements of tides. Now this involves then a concept of where these various deities came from in their own eternal existence. Here we then have another chain of patterns which belong to part of the concept of eternality itself. Life is an infinite progression of patterns. Life is an infinite unfoldment of infinite potential. No one can say or even imagine what the total potential of existence is. But it is assumed in philosophy of the idealistic nature that this potential, like the theolo theological assumption of God, is infinite. Therefore, all forms of growth that ever have been are part of it. All forms of growth that now are are part of it. All forms of growth that can ever possibly come into manifestation are part of it. Uh, thus, uh, what we would term the unfoldment of things is an infinite progression of growths, uh, very much like a cycle of many embodiments of man, for here the ancients also made use of the concept of rebirth. Uh, that rebirth itself is an infinite process of a kind, and that this process is a continual unfoldment of life. Thus, uh, in this universal concept, there is not only the continuance of these beings, but the unfoldment of their potential. Uh, thus, in time, all of these beings evolve, and even what we might term the great powers creating cosmic systems are still growing and must continue to grow. This growth began at some remote time and under some remote condition which we cannot even imagine. This growth in the end leads beyond any imaginable or conceivable state, but this does not mean that it actually ends. It is quite possible that growth finally passes to the point where there is no longer any galaxy, any physical form as we know it to represent the unfolding of a divine agent. But this simply means that as far as we are concerned, the process of growth passes beyond our conception and therefore we assume that it ends. We assume that when the galaxy dies, it dies. But this is no more a truthful assumption than the idea that when man dies, he is dead. We are only able to estimate a certain narrow visible area of growth, but this growth itself goes on and on and on. And it also came from a mysterious source. Now, uh, philosophers and mystics faced with this enormous sense of condition, uh, also had certain uh, hesitation within themselves. Uh, they did not actually know how to handle the idea of anything being so completely infinite and at the same time finite. They could assume that perhaps the most advanced deities uh, imaginable in space, even the twelve great gods of Miru themselves, could have begun at some incredibly remote time to grow up as man has done, as tiny organisms upon a tiny planet somewhere, that they too may have been atoms and electrons, that they may have been minute forms of life, infinitely less than we can imagine, even like the lives that make up our own body, which we cannot really estimate. Somewhere, sometime, they may have started with an extreme humbleness of things and go on and on and on, growing, 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 until perhaps they go past the growth of planets and suns and galaxies and perhaps become uh, infinitely, incredibly impressive or magnificent, uh, so vast we can no longer even imagine them. 
This uh, is all right up to a point, but it certainly ultimately gives the individual uh, not only a sense of inferiority, but a tremendous headache. It is impossible to estimate in m mental terms this infinite, inevitable, eternal growth without again falling into the same dilemma that all things that grow must have grown from something and grow to something. And the infinite process of, mo of movement from lesser to greater uh, provides us with so vast a landscape that it's hard to even conceive it. Suppose we say, for example, that every cell in man's body will ultimately unfold and become as great as the largest galaxy in the heavens. Um, there is no, nothing to prove that this could not be true. In fact, there is much more uh, to indicate the possibility that it is true than the assumption that we merely go down into the dust and remain there. Yet even if this is all true, uh, growth going on beyond imaginables and incredibles seems to present us with the possibility that somewhere, sometime, there will be such an, an incredible amassment of these vast things uh, that even space might be exhausted by them. Uh, there, is, uh, there is the same problem as was theologically expressed in early Christendom as whether or not the invisible universe was large enough to take care of the souls of the dead because the souls of the dead are so greatly outnumbering the living and from all living things forever something pours out into the invisible is there any possibility that the invisible will ultimately become full and as this now involves an added dimension of enlargement qualitatively and quantitatively the situation that evolution presents is almost as difficult an infinite condition an ultimate in which all things are infinite becomes rather a big problem. The uh, philosophical people, therefore, uh, came to the conclusion that at some point or some time things fulfill their archetypes. That in fulfilling their archetype, for example, in the case of a creation, that the archetype of the creation is the being that created it and that any, be, any evolution or process of growth within the area of this being ultimately caused the parts to become equal to the whole. Each creature became identical with the creating power that fashioned it. And in Indian philosophy, when this identity is reached, uh, the creation becomes identical with the creator. The creature and the creator have no longer any interval between them, and the part sinks back again to become one with the totality. That somewhere then in the infinite of things all divided parts are reunited in their own cause. Thus uh, in the very last of everything it is the deity of the creation that evolves. And this evolution is caused by the growth of the parts of itself. And when the parts of itself have completed their own growth then the power, the central power has attained its maturity and these parts become part of its own completeness like the cells of the body become part of the completeness of man and are no longer distinguishable from the total purpose of man himself. This was a good, uh, as good an answer as we may likely find and uh, with that we have to be content uh, for the moment. Uh, the uh, Indians, East Indians, uh, studying the situation therefore uh, reduce the matter from an infinite number of creations to which it is the same truth is applicable to the selection of one perhaps in this particular case a comparatively small and unimportant creation which we call a solar system a solar system is a pattern it is a design it is a form uh, a, an archetype a resident forever in the divine nature in other words, space in all of its parts is archetypal. All things grow according to patterns. All life carries pattern intrinsic within itself. Thus a life unfolding or evolving does not become a helter-skelter mass of animations. It becomes an organism, a structure, a thing in which there are limits upon all manifestations of activity 
these limitations making possible the gradual emergence of a specific form of life. Uh, we can't imagine what would happen if the life of carrot suddenly became beets, or if the life of man suddenly changed into an animal. Uh, these things are inconceivable, and uh, there is no example of their ever occurring. This is because each life impulse carries within itself the pattern of its own unfoldment and its own development. It is forever fulfilling a pattern. It is growing up into a likeness that is eternally its own. As in the case of the flowers of the field, there may be millions of a certain type of flower, but they will all grow up into the likeness of the pattern, which is their proper natures. So that uh, when the time comes, for example, for a solar system to manifest, the archetype of this solar system rests in the consciousness of its creating power. Uh, which in turn is only one of this great mass of evolving creative powers resident in the eternal essence itself. This power has existed before, has manifested before, has created before. But it has passed into the rest which exists between the great cosmic processes. So for a while the area of a solar system, uh, or where a solar system is to arise, remains placid, quiet. There is no evidence whatsoever of activity or animation within this area set aside. Then, as the ancients said, uh, a motion or an activity begins. This activity is very much like the impregnation of a seed or the beginning of the growth of the baby chick in the egg. There comes a time when to use an old term, the space involved in this process uh, curdles, that uh, activity arises within its own essence. This activity uh, being the re-emergence of a creating power. This re-emergence is extremely gradual and takes place uh, over a vast period of time, millions and millions of years. But gradually, and uh, according to the laws within itself, there emerges from this space, from this area set aside, the beginning of an organized existence. And in Indian philosophy, the concept is that in the beginning, at the very start of things, uh, what was termed the egg was fashioned. Now this egg is also found in the writings of the Gnosis, of Alexandria, it is the Orphic egg of Greece, it is the mysterious Druidic egg, and of course it is the world egg of the Hindus. Now the egg is used to symbolize this simply because man has no way of devising a better analogy. It is only a symbol. When we think of the cosmic egg, we are not thinking of the same kind you buy in a store. You are thinking, however, of a process arising in nature. Uh, that what we call this process has to do with the gradual arising of a fertile condition. A condition in which uh, situations are taking place by means of which the evolution of a universe uh, is possible. According to the beginning of the ancient system, at the very commencement of this great process in which the deity who is to be a solar system is awaking from the seven nights of rest sleeping like Vishnu upon the coils of the of the seven coils of the serpent of eternity when the time comes for this to happen uh, the consciousness of this being in the Hindu might be likened to Brahma, or in the Kabbalah would be likened to Ain, the boundless, uh, or in the uh, Gnostic theory might be considered uh, El de Boath, Lord of the Aeons, in the Nordic, All Father. When the uh, time comes for the manifestation of this, the fiat, or creative word, consists of an energy or a ray descending from the consciousness of the being, and this ray striking the mysterious 
albuminous substance of space spreads through it, fecundates it, and sets it aside for the creation of a world. This might then be uh, likened to the fact that it is the first step in the incarnation of a being into a body or a form. Uh, in the uh, Greek system, uh, the incarnation was the result of this ray causing the primary division of the two natures or ultimate conditions of space itself. Space was therefore regarded as potentially capable of sustaining two conditions, a point that was also made by Pythagoras. These two conditions become the beginning of polarization, and polarization is the beginning of creation. Creation and polarization are both the beginnings of division, and as Pythagoras also said, division is the beginning of death. Consequently, embodiment, the creation moving from its eternal suspension into objectification by its first movement determines its own end. In other words, the moment uh, the duality appears, the division of homogeneous existence into a polarized condition, the moment this occurs, the disintegration of this compound becomes inevitable. Two is the beginning of compound, and all compound is mortal. Therefore, all compound must be dissolved, as we find inscribed on the monument of Lord Bacon uh, at St. Albans. This division, the Greeks called ether and chaos, uh, it represented the division primarily of that part of existence set aside for a pattern of creation and that part which was not set aside. Uh, we have in this cosmic system always to remember also that in another place in space other universes were in various degrees of unfoldment. We are only referring now to the uh, beginning of a particular solar system. Others already exist, others will exist, some are disappearing, but now one is coming into birth. And in this coming into birth, uh, there is what the ancients call striving. And all existence, all life, is called the son of striving. And striving represents polarity operating upon itself. And in the uh, Gnostic and in the Greek, the action of the two principles, ether and chaos, on each other, uh, produce a, um, a motion. This motion is a whirlwind, a great turning of two currents, one affecting the other. It is like the inevitable force and the immovable object. Uh, these contrasts create motion, and motion is the beginning of creation as we know it. In the uh, ancient Nordic uh, Edas, we find, for example, that in the beginning there were two giants, uh, two orders of giants, frost giants and flame giants. And these two uh, standing one group on each side of the great cleft in space, which is the Hindu egg of Brahma, or the great womb of Miru within which creation exists. These giants, one of flames and the other of ice, hurl their flames and their ice into the abyss. And out of the strugglings, out of the strivings, out of the torturings of fire and ice, striking together, vast steam arose, great mist came and covered the surface of creation. And out of the sub substance of this mist was fashioned the body of Ema, the Frost King, the first of all forms. And from his forms, from his form, the gods later fashioned the world. But in our, our more simple, less symbolic system, uh, the, the concept is simply that by this creation of duality, a space, a place, was set aside in eternity. And in that moment, time was born, dimensions were born, durations were set up. And the inevitable incarnation of the deity itself was decreed. In the course of time, the deity established its most important point. Out of the tremendous strivings of these two, fashioning uh, the egg, 
there was established a boundary. Boundary being the uh, the, uh, the area, uh, the allotment, as it was called, of space set aside for a solar system. Uh, this allotment of space in its own turn could vary. Some solar systems are much greater in size than others. But each of these is determined by the power of the creating a being that begins to incarnate. The greater the power of this being, the greater the area which is set aside for it. But in the end, this area is likened to a vast globe. This globe divides space into two kinds of space. The unconditioned on the outside, which remains forever the seminal field from which other worlds can come. And the conditions or, conditioned or circumscribed space within the sphere. This being now set aside and apart for the creation of a universe, or in this case a solar system. Now, what we might more completely say would be that it is set aside as the potential body of the incarnating solar deity or solar logos. It is important to remember that in most of the ancient systems, the circumference was established before the center. This is a little difficult for us to imagine. We think of a center of life radiating and that perhaps the extreme circumference of the radius would then become the area uh, of the egg. Actually, however, in the old systems it was held that the circumference came first, even as in the case of the embryo. Uh, that which was first under the wall of the cell ultimately becomes the complete covering of the human body, evolution taking place within this. Uh, and always this wall, uh, this ring pass knot, constituting uh, the circumference of the deity's space allotment. When this entire area has been permeated uh, with the energy which this being causes to flow into it, we now have a space condition in which there is an eternal life and we have a limited space allotment in which there is a non-eternal life force operating. Uh, this is uh, very important to, to try to rationalize this situation, for it explains why in some of the older writings we are told that creation was accomplished by the gods gouging out holes in space, and that these holes became solids that the, it was the opening or the empty area that became a world. What we are, I think, trying to, to distinguish here is uh, that the impregnation of uh, abstract space with the life of a deity places a restriction upon abstract space. It is no longer in its pure form. Abstract space has disappeared, so to say, into the composition of concrete space. And concrete space is mortal, durable, non-eternal. And concrete space upon which forms are to be created is less than the abstract space that preceded it. Therefore, in comparison to the original, it is more of a vacuum than a reality. Once this area, like an alchemical bottle in a laboratory experiment of some old chemist, once this material area has been set aside as a globe, a mysterious bubble floating in eternity, uh, then we find uh, the uh, thought that Plato gives us pretty clearly defined, where he says the Logos impresses itself upon creation in the form of the cross. In the beginning, the Logos certainly uh, impresses itself by assuming its position in relationship to this uh, sphere which is to be its incarnating vehicle. From the materials within this sphere, the body of, cre of the created solar system must be fashioned. And it must do, be fashioned by drawing upon the resources uh, in the uh, part of space which has been allotted to a procedure. In that uh, point, then, according to Plato, the Logos impinges itself upon this sphere at the North Pole. 
that is, at the upper extremity of the, of the sphere. And here it takes up its original and primary position. From this point, it begins the problem of create, of, uh, we would say, conquering the field of its own manifestation. And according to uh, Plato, this is accomplished first by projection from uh, the pole of the now uh, in, uh, impregnated solar cell. And this consists of these four lines of fission which first appear and which still also appear in development of the impregnated human ovum. Here we find the beginning of the created process which is an infinite uh, fragmentation within this great sphere but the sphere itself is never divided. We are also told, therefore, that this beginning, this first place that arises in this sphere is the famous polar cap. It is the mysterious lotus cup crown of the great solar parent when it incarnates. It is also in terms of solar systems, it is the imperishable island. It is the place where the powers or deities first descend, as in the story of the Book of Enoch. Uh, this polar continent is again uh, mysteriously reflected downward through the various processes of creation until each planet has its polar continent and in turn each form of life has the equivalent to its polar continent including man for the polar continent in man is at the positive extremity of his magnetic field uh, being the upper part of the mysterious globe of energy which encloses him and is his miniature of the solar globe for the human being coming into incarnation first manifests by creating a globe of energy within which its body will develop by drawing upon the various resources of nature and the magnetic fields of its parents. So this uh, imperishable island, this uh, point which is the first to come and the last to go, becomes the first link uh, between uh, the deity itself which is not embodied and the creation which it intends to fashion. The creation must, like the embryonic development of man, reach a certain degree before it can be ensouled, before it can be quickened by the descent of the Logos into the vehicle which it is building. Now in the ancient systems of mythology, and in also in the oriental systems, the deity awaking into objectivity, which is reversing its polarity, for actually in Yoga and Vedanta we realize that the so-called awaking of the deity is actually its passing into the sleep of matter. So that what we call awakening is only in terms of our own consciousness. But in order to attain creation consciousness, uh, the being has to sacrifice the eternal consciousness of the space samadhi itself. That is the infinite uh, un unembodied consciousness the, the samadhi the cosmic state of consciousness has to be lost in the process of creation it is submerged and the deity is beginning to submerge its, this consciousness in the area which is to set aside for creation as the deity awakens objectively by going to sleep subjectively the hierarchs which it has brought with it come into manifestation also in man, according to the ancient belief, seven spirits incarnate along with the sovereignty of the divine soul itself. These spirits in man take up the seven vital functions of the body, becoming symbolically represented in the body by the seven vital organs, uh, as links by the seven uh, units of the endocrine chain, and finally, by seven mysterious points in the brain, which are called the Rishi or governors. Now, the same thing happens in the development of the solar system. The point at the north pole of the egg, or of the magnetic field, is the Miru, or mountain of the gods, 
and it is from here that all of the great creative processes take place. Incidentally, there is no correspondent southern pole, for all the growth moves from the positive. And in the uh, Hindu mythology, the suras, or the great powers of light, work from the north pole. But the asuras, which are the negative principles of receptive darkness, work from the south pole. <laughs>